DEFRA Minister Hugh Iranka Davies spoke to a gathering of industry experts and academics about the implications of the Marine and Coastal Access Act and how policy was shaping the marine environment. I will provide a step change to enable us to manage what we do in the seas in all the diverse complex nature of the uses we make of it all around our island. And this will give us a much more joined up approach, that horrendous word, holistic. But in the best meaning of that word, that is what it will allow us to do. Before the Act, the sea and its resources were policed and regulated and overseen by a huge variety of complicated arrangements. Arrangements that had evolved historically over a long period of time. DEFRA, other government departments, agencies, local authorities, public bodies and harbour boards all had, to a greater or a lesser extent, management and regulatory responsibilities for our coastal waters. The Act helps to change this. It gives us a robust legal framework for decision making, allowing people to make the right choices. In essence, we want to make it easier for everyone to work and play in the marine environment whilst at the same time meeting our long-term goals for coastal waters. And to back this up, we've created, as you know, one organisation to oversee the whole process. The Marine Management Organisation, which will be based in Newcastle and will be open for business in April. As the government's delivery body in English waters and the UK offshore waters for matters that aren't evolved, it is key to delivering an integrated approach to our marine environment. It will bring together management of marine activities including fishing, licensing and enforcement within one single organisation. And it will also be responsible for the whole marine planning system. And what this means in simple terms is better management of our marine resources across government and better, simpler arrangements for the stakeholders as well. At the local level, the Act will also ensure that we take an integrated approach to our marine resources by setting up not least the IFCAS, the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authorities. They are replacing sea fisheries committees <coughs> to modernise inshore uh, management, inshore fisheries management in England. And the heart of their work, this new organisation, is to balance the social and the economic benefits of exploiting the sea fisheries resources of the districts with the need to protect the marine environment from exploitation or helping it to recover from past exploitation. So what this means will be healthier fish stocks in healthier marine environments. The Tenifkas will draw on local knowledge to solve local problems through local decision making. And by the end of the month, we will have launched a campaign letting people know how they can apply to sit on the IFCA committees. So to all of you here in this audience, watch out for the adverts. But what the implementation of the Act will do is to provide much better coordination, better overall management of what is already in place. And let's be frank, the UK waters contain not only a very diverse range of activities, which provide livelihoods and a significant contribution to the UK economy, estimated at around £39 billion in 2007. Some of those organisations, some of those diverse interests include oil and gas extraction, minerals extraction, fisheries, <coughs> defence interests, expanding new industries like offshore wind energy, all of them need space. We also have to accommodate recreational uses and to protect heritage sites. And those are only a few of those diverse interests. But the Act allows us to take for the first time a properly <coughs> integrated approach to managing these busy seas. I'll just highlight one of those. The next round of offshore wind development, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, which has the potential to meet our target of 32 gigawatts from offshore wind by 2020. This unprecedented expansion of wind energy, the biggest expansion the world has ever seen, could also create, and it's not a minor incident, <coughs> up to 70,000 jobs. But alongside the economic benefits could be the environmental benefits that come from producing enough renewable electricity to power almost all the homes in the UK. And the 
a strategic environmental assessment which the government consulted on last year shows that we can manage this expansion of offshore wind crucial for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions whilst also safeguarding the marine environment and that is critical. Marine planning, that's just one illustration, but marine planning will help us to use our marine space more efficiently by considering what activities are compatible, even sometimes what activities are mutually beneficial when put together. And people in business and industry will get greater certainty about when they get a decision from the system. And I think that's something that I think everyone will agree is more important than the speed of any reply, is having certainty about what that reply might be because of the structures we're setting up. At the moment, various licenses are needed to build or place anything in the sea. Various licenses. These licensing decisions are currently taken on a case-by-case -case basis without the benefit of a clear strategic analysis. The marine planning system and the reforms to the licensing regime will improve this rather haphazard and confusing approach. Our marine policy statement will provide the <coughs> framework, the strategic framework for the seas for marine plans. The marine plans will allow us to better to make better use of the limited marine resources by pairing compatible uses wherever possible and taking a long-term view, giving us the benefits that we want. It will allow us to consider the best economic, environmental and social use of particular sites and to improve the regulatory processes by helping developers in selecting suitable sites for projects before the licenses are granted. Now it's important we get the marine policy statement right and your input, as ever, is going to be crucial in getting this right. We've already published a statement of public participation in this regard and this explains how people can get involved and actually help us. Some of you here will probably have attended the workshops last year that we held and we're planning to publish a draft marine policy statement for consultation this spring and we'll be holding more workshops both before and after publication. After seeking as many views as possible, we're aiming to publish the final version of the statement around spring <coughs> this year. We're often uh, accused within DEFRA of over-consulting but actually what we do want to do is get this right, so please make your input known. But we're also looking for people's input on the proposed marine plan areas and the criteria for where we should plan for first. For the very first time, we will be planning for our activities in the seas in this integrated way, and you'll be hearing about this tomorrow. The importance of all this work is brought into a very sharp focus when we realise that we have some of the richest marine ecosystems in the world in our waters. The marine planning system has got sustainable development and integration across policy objectives at its heart. But in addition, as many of you will know, the government is committed, has committed itself to establishing an ecologically coherent network of marine protected areas. <coughs> A network that is big enough to protect rare and threatened and valuable habitats throughout our <coughs> seas, with enough sites to conserve a range of major habitats that are vital for the health of our marine ecosystems. The Government will be making a statement to Parliament in March on the principles we intend to apply in establishing this network. And we also plan to publish a marine protected areas strategy in March. The Act builds on and improves protection and conservation of marine biodiversity by introducing marine conservation zones, which, alongside and not forgetting European sites, will be part of our network of marine protected areas. There are 12 new European sites currently under consultation, which, if accepted, should complete the network of sites under the Habitats Directive for offshore waters in England. And as many of you will know, and you'll have seen reported this month, the islands, uh, the water around the waters around Lundy became the UK's first marine conservation zone. Four regional projects are involving people with marine interests in identifying other marine conservation zones, and some of you might well be involved with those. These projects 
will be recommending sites to the statutory nature conservation bodies, JNCC and Natural England, which in turn will submit their advice to the government by autumn 2011. And we will then consult on the sites that we propose to designate and we'll have more marine conservation zones by the end of 2012. So you can see, with the Act receiving Royal Assent at the end of last year, things are moving very swiftly ahead. But it's not just the implementation of the Act that's driving forward this integrated approach we're taking. The European Commission's Marine Strategy Framework Directive will also be a very effective driver for improved management of the marine environment right across the EU. For our part, we're looking to transpose the directive into UK law by July to ensure that we're taking measures to achieve good environmental status for our seas by 2020. We are also, as many of you know, approaching a critical time for the reform of the common fisheries policy. Last year, the European Commission put forward its views on how to reform the CFP to reverse the decline in our fish stocks and placing ecological sustainability at the very centre of its proposals. From our point of view, what we want to see is that the fishing grounds of Europe are supporting healthy, ecologically sustainable fish stocks within this healthy marine environment. We want to see very obvious things, such as a reduction in the discarding of fish. It's a complex issue, but we know we need to move on it. We want the competing pressures on our marine environment managed responsibly in an integrated way so that its resources are conserved. Whichever changes are agreed, implementing them will not be easy. Because for fishing communities to survive, they need stocks that are viable, that are vibrant, and that are healthy for the long term. And there is increasing pressure to access our valuable marine resources. So fishermen and fisheries policy must work closely with others to protect the marine environment. Arguing for reform with evidence to back it up and proposals on how to achieve it is what we are doing, and it is the challenge for everyone involved in changing the common fishing, fishing policy. Reflecting our objectives for CFP reform at a national level is the Sustainable Access to Inshore Fisheries <coughs> Project, known as the SAFE Project. This aims to reform English inshore fisheries to deliver a thriving, a thriving and a sustainable inshore fleet. It has links to work on marine protected areas, IFCAS, improved fisheries science, and demonstrating the importance of approaching marine issues in a joined up way. And so far, I've only mentioned this evidence and the science in passing. But let me just turn to that for a moment. This summer, we'll be publishing Chart in Progress 2. This is an integrated assessment of the state of our seas. It will tell us the extent to which we are achieving our vision of clean, healthy, safe, productive and biologically diverse oceans and seas. And it's based on the evidence gathered by the UK Marine Monitoring and Assessment Strategy Community. <coughs> it will help us again to target our resources better to achieve this healthy marine environment. And it will also help us with the initial assessment of marine waters required by the Marine Strategy Framework Directive in 2012. Our seas, as it is clear, face many, many challenges, including the effects of climate change, particularly ocean acidification, and we need to be ready to meet all of these challenges. On the 3rd of February, the Marine Science Coordination Committee plans to publish the UK Marine Science Strategy. This strategy will set out the direction of travel for future marine science across the UK from 2010 to 2025. And it does so in a very targeted way, by identifying high-level priority areas for marine science and tackling cross-cutting barriers to help deliver that science. This strategy will shape, it will support, it will coordinate, 
and enable the delivery of world-class marine science for the UK. It will help to produce that crucial portfolio of evidence which we need if we're able to achieve this vision for our seas. And one example of this sort of joined up approach is the UK Ocean Acidification Research Programme. Now DEFRA has joined forces with the NERC and with DEC to fund this five year, 12 million pound research programme which itself is working with European and international partners. Another very practical example of a joined up approach, this time to the challenges facing our coastal communities, is the 11 million pound Coastal Change Pathfinder programme. And this is looking at innovative ways, innovative ways that are coming from you, as opposed to the man in Whitehall, of adapting to change in coastline. Last month, we announced the 15 local authorities which were selected as pathfinders to try out new approaches to planning for and managing this adaptation to coastal change in partnership with their communities. <coughs> we don't know everything in Whitehall, we need to rely on your expertise as well. For the marine environment as a whole, the challenge in a nutshell is striking a balance between conserving the environment and sustaining livelihoods. It always has been, it's more acute now than ever. We just have to get that balance right. We simply can't afford to get it wrong, not just from an environmental point of view, but from an economic and a social point of view as well. And that is why all the things I've mentioned are so important. That's why the Marine and Coastal Access Act is so important. But we can't give up on this. We have to keep the momentum going on implementing the Marine and Coastal Act and its provisions by continuing to work together to grasp the opportunity it now gives us to take a properly integrated approach to our seas.